Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is bluffing preventive war. So far, as we've tried to understand why bargaining may fail between a potential proliferator and its opponent, we've been focusing on commitment problem mechanisms. For example, when the opponent cannot effectively monitor whether the potential proliferator is building, the potential proliferator cannot credibly commit to not build in the absence of a good deal. And when a good deal is very expensive, we end up in a situation where sometimes the opponent is fighting a preventive war and sometimes the potential proliferator is building and we have a whole lot of inefficiency and a generally bad outcome for both parties. We've also explored situations where the potential proliferator's ability to threaten to construct nuclear weapons could change over time. One way this could happen is if the actual availability of nuclear weapons changes over time. That is, the potential proliferator has a cheap way to build nuclear weapons and it's feasible to do so today, but it might not be at a later date. Another way that this can happen is through the opponent's incentives, where perhaps it is unwilling to fight a preventive war now, but will be willing to fight a preventive war in the future. In both of these cases, the opponent would like to credibly commit to give concessions over the long term based on the potential proliferator's ability to construct nuclear weapons right now. But once that ability goes down or disappears, the opponent can't help but cut concessions. And this commitment problem forces the potential proliferator to construct nuclear weapons in the present before the window closes. But as I've hinted at before, the commitment problem is not the only mechanism that causes bargaining to break down. There's another class of mechanisms focused on information asymmetries. It might be the case that the opponent's willingness to fight a preventive war is unknown to the potential proliferator. Or the potential proliferator's ability to construct nuclear weapons, or their willingness to do so, might be unknown to the opponent. And that's what we're going to be focusing on for the next few lectures, beginning here now with this willingness to fight a preventive war being in question. Let's first review the logic of what happens when the credible threat of preventive war is well known to everyone involved. If the potential proliferator builds, the opponent calculates that fighting a preventive war is cheaper than passing and allowing a peace to transpire that just so happens to be advantageous to the proliferator and disadvantageous to the opponent. Internalizing that threat of preventive war, the proliferator is not willing to build, and instead accepts concessions from the opponent based off of the status quo distribution of power. Visualizing what this looks like, because the potential proliferator doesn't have nuclear weapons, and because the opponent is basing the concessions not on the potential proliferator's ability to construct nuclear weapons, but rather on the status quo distribution of power, the deal is relatively favorable to the opponent and not favorable to the potential proliferator. So that's what happens when it's well known that the opponent will intervene if the potential proliferator tries to construct nuclear weapons. Now let's review what happens when it's well known that the opponent would not intervene with preventive war. This is a two-step thought process. First, the opponent considers what the peaceful outcome will look like once the potential proliferator has acquired nuclear weapons. I'm representing that with the dashed line. This is much more favorable to the potential proliferator than the status quo was. In the present, the opponent buys off the potential proliferator by giving a deal that is roughly commensurate with that. But it can cheat a little bit and take a little more for itself because the potential proliferator doesn't have to pay the cost of developing nuclear weapons. By offering a nuclear deal corresponding to the solid line, the opponent ends up not as well off as in the case where it has a credible threat to fight a preventive war. But it doesn't have that credible threat here and it has to do the best given the constraints that it faces. And so rather than conceding the issue and allowing the potential proliferator to develop nuclear weapons, the opponent can do better by striking this agreement and extracting the surplus created by the potential proliferator not spending the costs on nuclear weapons. <laughs>
But everything that I just said is predicated on the idea that the credibility of preventive war is common knowledge. Imagine for a moment that that's not the case, that the potential proliferator is unsure whether the opponent would intervene or not. This might be because the potential proliferator does not know how much its opponent cares about the situation in general, or doesn't know about the opponent's tactical ability to initiate a preventive war successfully. Well, it's clear that an opponent without a credible threat to fight a preventive war has an incentive to bluff as if it does. That's because instead of having to give lots of concessions to convince the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons, the opponent can offer no concessions, have a deal that's based off of the status quo distribution of power, and do better as a result if the potential proliferator believes it, if it buys that bluff. In Chapter 7 of Bargaining Over the Bomb, I work through how each party should resolve the situation given the uncertainty. To begin, it's clear that a type of opponent with a very strong ability to fight a preventive war should not offer any concessions. It should just stand back and say, look, I have an ability to fight a preventive war very easily, and if you try building a nuclear weapon, it'll just be a waste of money for you. So don't do it. I'm not going to give you any concessions, but if you try doing anything else, it's just going to be worse for both of us. In contrast, a weak type without a credible threat to intervene has a dilemma. Clearly, as I just said, it has an incentive to bluff as though it's strong by standing firm and offering no concessions. And if believed, that would be great. However, the weak type needs to be worried that the potential proliferator might call what it perceives to be a bluff. And if so, the weak type is in a very bad situation. It can't fight a preventive war effectively, so it just passes and allows the power shift to happen. But that leaves the weak type in a worse position than if it had just conceded the issue in the first place and made a concession based off of the potential proliferator's ability to construct nuclear weapons. It turns out that the weak type's solution to its dilemma depends on the potential proliferator's beliefs about the opponent. If the potential proliferator thinks that the opponent is very likely to be strong, then the weak type also ought to offer no concessions. The potential proliferator is fully aware that when it sees no concessions, it might very well be facing a weak type that is bluffing. But the potential proliferator thinks that that's relatively unlikely, because the stronger type that would launch a preventive war if the potential proliferator were to build is much more likely by comparison. For example, if the potential proliferator thinks that there's a 99% chance that if it builds nuclear weapons, the opponent will initiate a preventive war, then calling that bluff which is only going to be 1% of the time a true bluff, is just not worthwhile. And internalizing that, the weak type has no reason to try to give up its weak position. It should just go ahead and pretend to be a strong type and offer no concessions, and bank on the fact that the fear of preventive war is going to coerce the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons. Things are more complicated if the potential proliferator believes that its opponent is likely weak. If the weak type were to always bluff strength by offering no concessions, then the potential proliferator would always want to call that bluff in response, which of course leaves the weak type in a worse position than if it had just struck a deal in the first place. Nevertheless, the weak type can't always concede the issue by offering full concessions either. If it did, think about the inference that the potential proliferator would make. Upon receiving an offer of full concessions, it would know that its opponent is weak, and nevertheless it's still going to accept those concessions because the concessions are better than paying the costs of building a nuclear weapon. Upon seeing the opponent standing firm, the inference that it would make is that the opponent is definitely a strong type. In turn, the potential proliferator would be deterred from developing nuclear weapons. It would believe that if it tried doing so, the strong type that it is certainly facing would initiate a preventive war, and that would be worse for the potential proliferator. 
But that being the case, the weak type would have an incentive to bluff once again. In other words, it can't be the case that the weak type is always distinguishing itself from the strong type by giving up and offering full concessions. Because if it did so, it would lose some of the value that it could be receiving by initiating a bluff. And so the weak type indeed is going to bluff some portion of the time. But it's not always going to bluff. If it tried always bluffing, then as I just said, the potential proliferator would respond to what it would think is very likely a bluff, initiate a weapons program, and make the weak type worse off than if it had just offered concessions up front. So by only sometimes bluffing, the weak type puts the potential proliferator in a situation where it's not exactly sure how it should respond. It's not clear that the potential proliferator should be building, and it's not clear that the potential proliferator should be accepting no concessions. Now thinking about how the potential proliferator should respond to what may very well be a bluff, sometimes it should call that bluff by attempting to develop nuclear weapons, and sometimes it should just accept the fact that it's receiving no concessions. Why is this the case? Think about this like a game of poker. By calling a potential bluff some portion of the time, the potential proliferator is deterring the weak type from always offering no concessions whatsoever. Indeed, the outcome that a weak opponent receives conditional on the potential proliferator calling the bluff is worse than what the opponent would have obtained had it just offered concessions in the first place. That's because the ultimate settlement that's implemented is corresponding to the dashed line rather than the solid line. So the opponent is losing out on the surplus that would have been created by the potential proliferator not wasting money to develop nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, the strong types just fight a war. This helps make sense out of something that we've seen before. In the 1980s, Iraq built a nuclear reactor out in the middle of the open desert. Saddam Hussein was banking on his belief that Israel would not have the political will to intervene and destroy it. Of course, that's not what happened. Israel did have the political will and destroyed the reactor. Transitioning to today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has taken a similar stance. No concessions to Iran and threats to intervene if Iran were to try developing nuclear weapons. But despite Israel's consistent rhetoric, it's not clear how things would play out if Iran tried developing nuclear weapons. Two things are different between this case and the situation with Iraq from many years ago. First, Iran has been more strategic in how it places its facilities. One of them is actually under a mountain. We're not dealing with something that's in the open air. And so destroying this would be more complicated than just perhaps dropping bombs. It would seem that you would need to put troops on the ground which would result in more casualties and more things that could potentially go wrong. Second is distance. Israel is much closer to Iraq than it is to Iran. And so whatever plan Israel has to fight and destroy nuclear facilities in Iran, it's going to have to figure out how to get both to and from Iran without suffering any problems in the meantime. And it's not immediately obvious that Israel can come up with a plan that will successfully do that. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.